So we'll get to introductions in a, in a little bit, but welcome everybody and thank you for participating. We're brought together and thank you all for coming because four people have chosen to do a reprise of the Donner Party rescue expeditions. This comes on the heels of their having done a reprise of the trek of the Forlorn Hope last year, which set the rescue expeditions in, in motion. They do this because the Donner Party is more than problems. It's more than bad decisions and dissension and wrong turns twice and mendacity and evil and horror filled and even murder. It's about heroism and determination and self-sacrifice. It's about the very best of what makes human beings. And that's what our trekking friends are celebrating, heroism instead of sensationalism. It's about an untold story. And this evening, we've got a modern COVID version of a fireside chat to just kind of talk about things. What are we aiming at? To gain some insight. Why is this topic so pervasive? Why do people keep coming back to it? And what, what's the impact of the Donner Party, both good and bad on, on people today and on families? So first, let's introduce ourselves with at least your connection to the Donner Party and how you relate to the story and what attracts you. I'm Bill Odegeist. I live on Donner Summit. I'm part of the Donner Summit Historical Society. And a couple of years ago, a couple of guys came in and they were talking about an expedition to redo the Forlorn Hope and they dragged us into it. So there you are. <clears throat> so since then, uh, I've had to do a lot of... Uh, work to let our readers of our monthly heirloom, our newsletter on Donner Summit history, uh, know what the background is for these various things. So that's what my connection is to the Donner Party. And of course the theme there where it's uh, the heroism versus the sensationalism. So let's start, I, you probably have a different configuration of pictures of people on the screen. So why don't we start with uh, Bob, who's in my upper left. Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Crowley, and one of the, uh, the For Forlorn Hope and, and now uh, Donna Relief Expedition members. So delighted to, to, to be here and, and looking forward to the conversation. And then below him in my configuration is Frank Mullen. Hi, I'm Frank Mullen. Um, I am a journalist and uh, uh, wrote a book called The Donner Party Chronicles, which was a day-by-day -day account of their year-long trek and entrapment, which started as a newspaper series on the 150th anniversary, which is hard to believe that was 25 years ago. Uh, and also, uh, uh, since then, I've continued researching the Donner Party, and uh, I do uh, uh, Chautauqua, which is a living history performance, and three of my characters are related to the uh, uh, the Donner story. And so I've got a lot of connection there in terms of telling that story. So I'd like to mention that uh, Frank's book, Donner's Party Chronicles is really a good book. It gives an awful lot of detail. It's a good resource. And if you wanna read a review of it, go to the review page of our Donner Summit Historical Society.org and you can read about it before you go looking for it. It's out of print right now, but you can still find it in different places. Uh, just below me on my configuration is uh, Tim Tweetmeyer. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm one of the four uh, trekkers that uh, participated a year and a plus go on the Forlorn Hope. And uh, we'll be going out here in a week and a half and uh, doing the reprise the relief party. And, just like the Forlorn Hope, we've been fascinated by the personalities and the uh, human determination that it took to do this as people that go out there voluntarily to run in the mountains. Uh, it's an eye opener to experience what they did. So it's great to be here. All right. Next are Judy and Dave DePew, who don't have a picture up. They just have their names. They're a little shy, I guess, tonight. <laughs> There they are. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's magic. So, so we're, on, we're on basically just support team. We're part of the uh, Donner Summit Historical Society and the Truckee Donner um, Historical Society and Railroad Society. And uh, we've just been helping along doing the PR and maps and any place that we can help the team out, we try. Okay, good. Does Dave want to say anything or have you taken care of it? 
Hi, Dave. <laughs> How do we get the names back, Bob? They pop, they flash in and out. Yeah, just put your cursor over anybody and, and oh, you'll see the names will pop oh. right back. So next on uh, my configuration, Donna Deal. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad you're doing this. I'm a great granddaughter of Nancy Graves, who was one of the youngest survivors of the Donner Party. And so I've grown up with this story and I, many in our family did attend the Bicentennial and bought your book, Frank. It's, oh. it's a treasure. Yeah. We were there and um, we lived every day that year. And also we lived every day with the Forlorn Hope and really appreciate that the, the true heroes, the rescuers are being honored now. Thank you. Thank you. Elka Reimer. Hi, uh, as, as Bill O. said, I'm Elka. I'm one of the um, Forlorn Hope and party uh, rescue party <laughs> members and you know just this is this is a very special night to to meet all of you and um, just the more I learn about everyone involved the more involved I become myself and you know this has become a, a part of my fiber it's really an honor to be a part of it that shows you have good taste <laughs> Cindy Bruce <laughs> Hi hey there. Um, I have to apologize. I'm in a house with 12 women in Santa Barbara, and we just all got here for a women's wine weekend. So it's a little loud. So after I, I, inter after I introduce myself, I'm going to put myself on mute. So I, I apologize about the background noise. Um, I'm a direct descendant. So George Donner Jr. was the son of Jacob, and he and his sister Mary were two of, well, his only surviving children, and they were part of the last group of kids or people brought out um, in late April. So um, it's been clearly a huge part of my family growing up. My great grandma um, was born and raised in the house um, in Sebastopol, California, in the Donner, the original Donner farm. Um, and we've, we have a few things that have been passed down through the family and um, stories. And, and there's some interesting things that maybe we can talk about a little bit later that um, came through family stories that I have not been able to um, find any other information about anywhere in any of the history books or anything. And so um, just, it's just, a, it's always been a big part of my life. So. We'd love to hear some of that. And finally, mm -hmm. Jennifer Hemmen. Hey everyone, um, I'm Jennifer Hemmen and I'm also one of the trekkers from the Forlorn Hope and will be going out again. Um, and I just want to echo what Tim and Elka said, this is just amazing um, to, to meet you guys and to put names with faces. Uh, it's, it's just overwhelming, it really is. I'm originally from Boston, so to be uh, full disclosure, I'm an East Coaster, but I've lived out here 25 years and I feel that the, the, the Donner Party story has become as much a part of me as I am a part of the East Coast, so I, I really feel honored to, to learn so much about this part of the country that I, I now have called home for almost 25 years. So, and it's just really neat to meet people with such deep roots. Well, belatedly, welcome to California. <laughs> <laughs> so for the last couple of weeks, we've been playing with a set of topics that we wanted to throw out, particularly to the Donner Party's uh, family survivors. They just uh, kind of start a conversation. The first one is a little bit uh, complex. Many people think history is dry, boring, already happened, and a waste of time. The Donner Party participants are all dead and buried and turned to dust. Why would we want to spend time on the story of failures? The Donner Party took the wrong turn twice. They fought with each other. They followed bad advice. They had bad decisions. They deserved what they got. There are a lot of other things that deserve attention. So why should we pay attention at all to this uh, story. Mm, I have an answer to that. The reason it's lived on, I think, it was so sensationalized at the time by the East Coast paparazzi. They couldn't get enough of what they called cannibalism. That word has always offended me. I think any parent whose child is starving to death 
would be willing to give them the frozen dead flesh buried in the snow of those who had perished. So to me, that is not cannibalism. I have trouble with that word. It is um, survival and cannibalism to me is killing someone to eat them. Now there are stories that that happened too. I choose to deny them. Well, it completely overshadows uh, what I think is the main story, which is the heroism. And to your point, there was Franklin Graves offering up his own body to his to children to keep them going. Well, he was a hero too, because he grew up in Vermont. He was the one who had the skill and knowledge to make snowshoes from the oxbows and the strips of leather of the dead cattle and oxen. Without those snowshoes, that party would not have mm -hmm. gone over the summit. What about some of you others? Why is uh, why is this story capture the public's attention beyond the sensationalism, and why should we, or why pay attention to it? Well, if you're a West Coast, oh, go I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go right ahead. I'll be right behind you. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it's it's truly the making of the West Coast, if you think about it, right? They came over in 1846, which was a, quite a bit earlier than when a lot of the other big stories that you hear about the Oregon Trail and the, you know, coming over. And it was so early in the, in the migration over and there was so much that happened. And, and, and think about, they were just regular farmers and people. And, you know, Jacob and George, the captains, they were, Old, older, older than I am. They were in their fifties and late fifties and sixties, and to think that they had the perseverance to cut to do something like that and uproot their entire family—that is not anything that anybody, myself or even my daughter, she's in her twenties, that none of nobody in our like we can't fathom what that would be like to just like okay, let's just you know take our entire family and everything we know and do this trek for months on end and what that would have taken to do that and what drive you would have to do that. Um, and just the physicality of it and, and all that we're just so our world today is just so different. I can't imagine any of us doing that. And to me, it's just that to me, it's an, it, it just is, it boggles my mind to think that they were able to do that and that they did what they did. So it's the experience of the common people rising to the challenge mm -hmm. that's before them and preparing them or making the challenge uh, to begin with. They were a lot tougher in those days than uh, we are. Clearly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, there's a little bit of a parallel between uh, the Forlorn Hope and the, and the Relief folks, which, uh, you know, obviously the Forlorn Hope group, uh, a group of mothers and fathers and, and a few older folks like Franklin. I mean, he was the guy that inspired me because I was about his same age when I read, uh, you know, uh, in different stars. It just fascinated how someone could compel everyone to, OK, guys, we're, we're going over the mountains. Here's your snowshoes. Let's go. I think he was kind of the impetus there. And I was reading the other day, going back over my story of uh, the relief party and how the relief party, the first relief, you know, they only took a hatchet, a cup and a blanket with them and spent many nights in this Sierra. And you think of how cold, when, I was just noting the weather for us on the pass is gonna be 18 degrees. How you could spend an evening at, in a blanket in a cup at 18 degrees up there. And and I say, I, I always said something else to Elk on those guys the other day about uh, George Stewart's account of that. It's, the relief party was just a bunch of people that already come over, but they were not mountain men. They were, there was a couple of sailors in there and uh, you know, a couple of farmers from the Midwest. And other than the fact that they'd been over the pass once on the other direction, you know, they were just a couple of average Joes, but, uh, and, and even them more compelled because they had no family um, necessarily back there and uh, found a way to persevere. I, I think what it comes down to for me when I read stories of like this is that it, I think it shows what a human being is capable of, uh, not just physically like we're talking about. Yes, we know these people were tougher than us, but I think that it's a story about love and it's a story about what we're capable of in terms of courage and what we're capable of in terms of um, what love can drive you to do and what you can survive if you 
care enough. And that can be the same as John Stark just saying, I don't need any money to do this. I'll, I'll, I'll do this because it's the right thing to do. That, that's a form of love. He didn't know them, but that's a form of love as well. And I think a story like this can teach many truths about, about how powerful that is. So that's timeless, really. I mean, we, we even see that in modern days, right? People who come upon an accident and get out of their car and dive into a burning car. You, you don't even think about it. You just do what's right. Uh, I've got a question for uh, Donna and Cindy. Uh, when I first started doing research on the uh, uh, on the Donner Party in preparation for the newspaper series that became the book, uh, I one of the first things I wanted to do was get hold of descendants, and uh, some of them, like uh, uh, Loki Page, who uh, uh, was from Sacramento, said that her family. Uh, didn't talk about it when they were kids. Uh, and if you asked, she said, you know, I, I asked my grandmother about it one time, she nearly slapped me silly. You know, we don't talk about that in this house. And then there were others who said, no, we're, uh, yeah, my name is so-and-so, but everybody thinks I'm related, but I'm not related. And I, I found out they actually were. This was a judge actually uh, in Reno who, uh, I guess uh, his daughter said he doesn't want to be known as the cannibal judge. So he's <laughs> dying his relationship to, to it. But uh, I guess uh, when, it, how has this connection, if at all, affected your life uh, growing up and, and, and uh, uh, was it a negative influence, positive influence, or, or just you didn't really think about it much? Interesting question. Uh, um, I'm glad Tim mentioned Under the Indifferent Stars. Growing up, my mother, who was the granddaughter of Nancy Graves, and my father supported her, we were not allowed to read anything on the Donner Party except McLashen. Mm. Isn't there a descendant McLashen here? Because he never mentioned eating human flesh. He never mentioned it in his history. It's the only book we were allowed to read. Well, as I grew up and read more and more and more and more, I realized there was no way they could have survived. But um, under the indifferent stars, I said at one point, I probably read 20 books, mostly the sensational type, but I said I wouldn't read another till they changed the ending. And then I was told you must read Under the Indifferent Stars. He did so much research, such a wonderful author. And he's the only one who went into the science of what happens to a human body that is starving to death and what happens as a human body freezes to death. It's just a wonderful book. And the fact that he showed chose my great grandmother's older sister as the heroine. She was the one who married just before they left. And she's the one who said goodbye to her husband under the indifferent stars. Um, gosh, I, I, I would just say is to answer your question directly is that in my family, my great grandma, um, Carrie, um, grew up, like I said, she grew up in the house um, in Sebastopol, so in George Donner's actual homestead. And she, um, her entire life was dedicated to educating everybody and anybody that would listen on what from the family's perspective really happened and that it wasn't cannibalism and, and, and it wasn't to be sensationalized and it was about all of the other things that went into it. Her literally from as long as I can remember, she just was always like, you know, the history and what you're learning in school is wrong. She actually would go into schools when my dad was growing up and be a guest speaker and talk to the kids in history and, and, it, and tell them from, from her you know, stories in the family growing up and, and things that had happened. And so it was always, it, the way I grew up learning about it was a lot of what you read is not really right. And that there's so much more to it um, because there is obviously, as we all know. And of course, now we have the beauty of better stories and better 
t- retellings of it and, and a better, you know, it's not the, his, it's not the sensationalized stories that they had back in the day, like when my dad was growing up. So for us, it was never embarrassment or hidden under, it was, you know, we were very proud of it and always were, you know, I, that's just always been a big part of it and educating people and understanding, you know, helping people understand the, just the grit of these humans and not even just the people that came out West, but you know, the folks that came in to rescue them. I mean, unbelievable to me. I mean, that is just, everybody needs to read and understand those stories because it's, well, I, I wouldn't be here if it didn't happen. So, <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> to your prejudice. Yeah. I mean, and, and in our family, we always were, and yeah, you know, people make jokes and all that, but I don't let that bother me because I always take it back to what is the, you know, the reality of the situation. Right. And, and, it, and it's interesting that there are other stories about survival that don't get the same negative connotation, which that to me is really interesting. So, um, but I've never, for us, it was always a big topic of family. Um, and it was a, you know, we were proud that we were part of that um, history. So your pride stems from the challenges that they set for themselves and the difficulties that they overcame. Or, or is there another source of pride there in this story? I just think for, you know, I mean, for my family, it was really just knowing that they were a part of it, I suppose. I mean, George was only 10 when he was rescued, right? So his entire family, everything he, everybody he knew, everybody around him died. So he watched his entire family, his parents and everybody die, right? He was 10 and his sister was nine. Um, So maybe our family has a little bit, uh, a view from a child's eye perhaps from the stories that he told my great grandma and, or her, I guess my great, great grandma, sorry. (laughs) I get all the, I get all the generations mixed up, but you know, maybe some of the stories are from his perspective, which might be skewed from a child's, child's eye. Um, But it's, yeah, I I don't know. Never, never shame or anything. Cindy, I, I don't know if we ever relayed that story of the forlorn hope trip we made, but we had come out of the river, um, coming up to Colfax and had crossed the highway. We were just getting off the off ramp there and heading down towards what's known as Placer Hills Road. And there's this gentleman standing on the side of the road. We said, he said, hey, how you guys doing? I saw you on the news or something. I said, great. You know, we're having it's a nice day. And I said, what are you doing out here? He said, I just came to cheer you on. He goes, oh, you, did you know the story? He goes, yeah, Tams and Donner was my great, 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 great Ow. aunt. And I was just like blown away. There's this guy on the side of the road out in the middle of nowhere, but he wanted to see us. It was, it was so heartwarming. Clearly he had pride in the story too. What about you, Donna? Where does the pride come from? Oh, beginning with survival and perseverance. Perseverance is kind of an outstanding trait, but, um, Somebody mentioned the history books, not telling the story straight. California social studies teaches California history in fourth grade. I was a fourth grade teacher for several years. And I told the story and I would bring the coin. Do you know the story of the Uh Graves coins that Uh Franklin Ward building his wagon drilled holes because he knew they would they, they would suffer attacks or um, dangers. So he drilled holes in the post and put the coins in there. And Elizabeth, when people were perishing around her, realized they might not make it. She took all those coins and buried them at Alder Creek, is it, that runs through there? And then the next year, miners were mining at the creek and they found the coins. So Uncle Bill, William Graves, the oldest member of the family was able to claim them as the family coins because one of the gold coins was used as a teething ring for the baby. So it had baby teeth marks in it. Those coins were passed down to the family. I have one and I'm often asked by colleague teachers or friends who have fourth graders to go into the classroom and share the story. And I take my coin. Wow. We can get a picture of that coin. Yeah. Could we get a picture of that coin? Maybe mail it to Bob or 
bill or you can actually i have a son who teaches high school in pleasanton and he's the most interested i wanted him to take my place tonight but he he actually goes up often and rides his bike to the summit in the summer he is just He's the one in our family who has taken on the most interest. And because he is a teacher, I've put the coin in his hands for now. Okay. But he'd be happy to share it with anyone. Yeah, Donna, have him, have him send a, uh, in an email a picture of that coin to me. You have my address. We'd love, okay. to, we'd love to see okay. it. That's we would a, love it, to it, have it him always, up there, right? Yeah. It always we would love to invite him up. When, well, I invited him. I wanted him here. I wanted him to speak instead of me. But, uh, and uh, I wanted to say in my book, I have a picture of the, the two men who were hiking and found the, the cache of, of coins. And, and uh, you have their picture in your book? Oh, yeah. In, in the, yeah, yeah. That, that's, the book, that's in several uh, books, right. The two men were photographed next yes. to the tree stump and they, they had all the coins spread out and and uh, and just like you said it was identified by uh, uh by graves yeah. it had a hole in it one of them because it was on a string the teething ring and they could see the baby teeth marks and stuff but yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wow so those were passed to the oldest in this family and my mother's was given to my older brother but i had an uncle who had no children he gave his to me and he was a track star. He went to Stanford on a track scholarship. And he had a hole drilled and a silver chain. He always wore that. It was his good luck piece. So mine is on a silver chain. There's That's very right. few items that actually were from the, from the actual encampment. So that's really cool that you actually have something from the encampment. Yeah. We have stories in our family. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's most important, the stories. Yeah. One, one of the things mm -hmm. that, um, <clears throat> that we, we believe we've, we've got a lead on is, is um, when we were recreating the Forlorn Hope Trail, which, which as all of you know, they only took it once because they were lost and they didn't record it. There was no map. They didn't know where they were. And even when they were interviewed after, they don't know where they were. And so it's not um, an easy trail to recreate, but we've tried hard and we think we have probably an 80, 85% assurance of where it is based upon all the research we did. And one of the places that we, we believe we may have um, come upon is Camp of Death, which particularly um, for you, Donna. Yes, that's. Is, uh, is meaningful because if, yes. if it is indeed Camp of Death, of course, that's where, where Franklin um, is, uh, his remains are there. And uh, so we're, we're, we're continuing to pursue that. Um, we are uh, working with archeologists now. And uh, oh, really? to the point you've made, Cindy, there's not a lot of artifacts as you might imagine but if, some there bones, were, have there, there been four, bones found? Well, there, there, the bones um, in the particular area that we've located, um, there would have been teeth. That would have been the only uh, leftover. And, okay. and because mm -hmm. they built the camp and actually built the fire over a creek, they didn't know it at the time, it's 20 feet of, of snow. But as that fire stack melted down and ultimately fell into the creek, on um, <clears throat> that area, every spring gets washed out. And so the archeologist doesn't believe the teeth would have possibly remained because they would have left the remains on top of the snow. Snow would have melted. They would have been right on top. And then you can imagine when the water comes rushing through, all of the remains would have been rushed to the bottom. However, there is an ax head that they, if you remember the story uh, from reading uh, a number of stories, Frank's and Daniel J. Brown, but they lost their axe head uh, uh, on Christmas Eve. And um, we, we've got advancement on that and, and some forensic dogs that have come in and actually scented quite a few um, human remains. So we're gonna continue to pursue that just as a by the by. And obviously we'll stay in touch um, 
because uh, four of the four Lorne Hope perished there, if if that's the area. And and I think the reason for bringing that up is that the the, the lack of artifacts, as uh, Cindy you you brought up, is is really very very true. And so a lot of the history um, we're going on uh, oral history in some cases, which the Native Americans completely rely on. And uh, you know, in America, people want facts. They want evidence. They want proof. And so that's all part of the the new age of news. Is can we produce with technology now better evidence of uh, of what happened? And and certainly, it's an exciting dawning of another generation of people that want to go back and and relook at what happened and and maybe provide some more answers. So you're just going to refer to the word. idea that there was an axe that was lost there and tantalize them with possibilities? Yeah, well, yeah, we found the axe head. Oh, you didn't say that. Well, we found a axe head. Oh. <laughs> we, we're, we're not, we're not uh, scientific forensic experts, nor are we archaeologists, and we haven't had it taken out of the lab to the lab because you're not allowed to take artifacts from uh, land that's not yours. And that's the Nat Tahoe National Forest. So we put it right back where we found it. But, um, but our archeologist thinks it's pretty interesting. And uh, we're, we're hoping maybe this year we can pull the permits and get in there and get some answers. And if, if it is uh, the acts that we think, then it would be Franklin Graves' acts. So to be continued. To be continued, yeah. Are any of you familiar with Kristen Johnson's book, Unfortunate Immigrants? Yes, you'll find she interviewed me a lot. She called us our graves because the Donners and the Reeds and the Breens had all been written about so much, but she didn't think enough had been written about the graves. And she tells a story that um, I knew, maybe I told her, that it's just how cruel children can be because Nancy as an orphan was taken in by a family at the Blaisdells in Jose and sent to a public school and children at the school would tease her that she was only alive because she ate her mother's breasts. And she lived with that all her life. She um, yeah, really didn't want to discuss the tragedy ever. So that left her with a weight hanging over her during her life. Oh, absolutely. Is there anything about the story that uh, affects you still today? She married a Methodist minister and um, he was a circuit riding Methodist minister and she became quite devout. She wrote his obituary when he died and it's very, it shows her devotion to their religion. But one of the places where he ended up, his camp, circuit riding, they go from camp to camp. And it's here in Sebastopol where I've lived for 65 years. And um, that camp, I can still go there in that redwood grove and see the virgin redwood that was cut down, this huge stump, that was his altar. So yeah, it, I'm surrounded by family history here. How about you, Cindy? Are there still effects maybe on your life from this story? Absolutely. You know, I mean, I would say when I hear some of the, you know, like people getting teased and I know that my, so my great grandmother was the one that was really um, the most outspoken about it, but my grandmother was more embarrassed by it and would not talk about it. And unfortunately we lost a lot of um, things that we had of Mary Donners and George Donners because she just didn't care as much and she didn't want to, uh, you know, talk about it. Um, and so, you know, and that makes me sad because I've always been so interested in history and to me it's fascinating and I want to learn more and I want to know more. And I, I want to go down the rabbit trails of the family stories that we hear and find out, you know, is there any truth to that? 
because a lot of times, you know, you hear the family stories, right? And, and who knows if they're really true or not. And so I'm the only one um, really of our whole, our family is pretty small. But I seem to be the only one that's the most interested in it and, and learning more, but it, it does, it, it hurts. It makes me feel sad that, that people feel that way. And that, I don't know, people are mean. I think Donna, that's what you said, right? I mean, kids are mean, people no, can be mean. Can be very mean. <laughs> they can't, well, and they don't know they're, they're being mean, right? Really- Yes, it was very abusive. Yeah. yeah. There are, are other artifacts. I think Patty Reed's Doll Among. That's a book mm-hmm. that I always had fourth graders read. But I think that's in the Sutter Museum mm-hmm. in Sacramento. It's, I think the doll is there. Yeah. And one what, of my. Didn't aunt, it used to be at the summit, right? It used to be at the summit, I thought. I, I asked when I was there hmm, just a couple of years ago. Okay about the coin, one of my aunts oh. gave her Donner Party coin to the museum at Donner Summit. And um, I asked about it and they said they gave many of those to the museum at Sutter's Fort. So I want to go there and check it. So Cindy, your grandmother was embarrassed, but she was embarrassed by the sensationalism, which is yep. part of human nature, I guess, to focus on that. And she, didn't uh, get saved by the other stories of tenacity and heroism and sacrifice. And that's what a shame that is. Yeah, it really is. And, and, and it's just so, but I I don't know. I don't know what it was about her, but she just, she just bottled it up and and was ashamed and would not talk about it. So. My um, mother was like that too. That's why I, I wasn't allowed to read anything but McLashen's book. The one, the book that made me, realize this is okay to eat frozen flesh if you're starving to death was the book alive about the soccer team and the Andes right and reading that and how they debated and how you know the only survivors were the ones who were able to eat the frozen human flesh those who it was against their religion or whatever they perished and you know that's a question I guess everyone would have to answer for themselves in a similar situation. Well, and what's did. interesting about, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna follow up question for Donna. Did, is there ever been discussion um, in the family about Jonathan and Elizabeth, who of course also survived. They were brought out by- The babies? Relief, Relief Party Three, along with, with Nancy but then perished soon thereafter at Sutter Ford. Right. Um, I don't know why, I I don't, has anybody ever researched where they just, were their bodies so famished they couldn't survive? I don't know. Good question, good question, don't know. That's the way it's written on the books that I've seen was they were just so, you know, kind of run down from the, from the, uh, trip and whatnot that they weren't able to recover once they got rescued. Right. But, you know, again, it, well, you know, I was just going to mention, you know, Bill, Bill wrote a really great little short booklet. I think where are you going to have your booklet, Bill, on the, on the re- forlorn hope and rescue? Is that going to be at the museum or? Hey, park people are handing it out to, for free to everybody yeah. who has a ticket into the indoor uh, festivities and they're going to be selling it in their bookstore. Yeah, it's the first time I've seen, there you go, that I've seen somebody, oh, you know, oh, write you? about the heroism and, the, it, and the human, um, you know, stuff. And it's great. Yeah, you can't see it, Bob. Yeah, it doesn't come into no focus, good. But okay. it, it's just I a, what, 20 it. page thing? It's fantastic. Well, yeah. excuse me. It's more can't like 48. 48, yeah, sorry. <laughs> 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 I was never good at numbers. <laughs> But I mean, that's the, one right? of the reasons we love the story because I mean, it's always been written as this kind of, you know, uh, you know, collection of mistakes and bad choices. But I think there's a lot of more positives in there that people tend to, to miss along the way that uh, we can lift some of these other stories up. And it's not just a bunch of guys getting stuck in the snow. It's, it's about some people doing things that aren't normal. It's almost superhuman. Here's an idea, and you could all weigh in on this, but particularly the survivors, Bob has been talking about reprinting that booklet with uh, your adventures from this year, as well as some other things, including some of the people who were were left out. 
What about uh, an introduction to it that goes into the sensational aspects of the story that people have been talking about ever since 1847, and then goes into the heroism and the uh, tenacity and the very best of the human spirit. Would that be uh, an appropriate way of doing things? Please do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, um, to show there's a sensational story and then there's the real heroic story would be great to have in one book. I don't know anyone who's done that. Yeah, there, and there, I, there, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, the whole part of the newspapers and all that being so sensational too, that was also the time when that's what newspapers did. That, that's, that's all they printed. Was this, that's just the way they covered things too back then. So there's a little bit of that mixed in there too, from a, if you look at it from a historical standpoint. Whereas like the McGlashan book and other actual books are different, the newspaper articles tend to be the ones that are more sensationalized. Yeah, hey, Frank, you want to comment on that as a newspaper man? Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, we're talking 1840s here. Yeah, right? no, like, not today. no, I'm not, I'm not, not that old. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not provoking <laughs> an argument. I, I think he has a perspective. Uh, the papers from the uh, 19th century, uh, in, in particular, uh, Mark Twain got his start in Virginia City by making things up. Uh, and and all the Dan DeQuill and all the other journalists uh, in, in the Comstock in Virginia City would simply, if they had nothing to write about one day, they would write about a, uh, a mechanical man who was dug up in the desert and was and, and got caught walking around uh, or or uh, uh, any kind of sensational stuff. And and I just did a blog post uh, for Bob on those early articles in the California Star. Uh, where the, the, the horror of the situation wasn't bad enough for them. They had to embellish it with horrible scenes of children looking on while their mom ate their dad's heart and wouldn't let the kids have any. And, you know, just uh, they had Keysburg eating children yeah. like they were M&Ms. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, right. next, you know, and, and just wild stuff like that. So, yeah, that was part and parcel to the way newspapers were in the 19th century. They'd always try to top each other and having no news to write about was not an impediment in getting the, those papers filled every day. Interesting. Well, later on, it's how we got pushed into the Spanish-American War was that yellow journalism, sensationalism got people stirred up which I guess is the purpose, but go to the supermarket, that stuff's on the supermarket racks there and somebody's buying that. You ever read the book, um, one of the a good, another really good, much like in different stars, uh, non narrative nonfiction uh, in the kingdom of ice by Hampton sides. And that they describe in there the first hundred pages of the book or so is about how the newspapers in the late 1800s, they drove some of these stories and these rescue missions and stuff, because that's what sold newspapers. So the newspapers would underwrite these ship captains to go try to make their way through the 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 north the the north route right between uh you know eastern canada and all the way over to japan and that that's what sold newspapers so it was really fascinating to see how in the you know that 1800 era newspapers drove you know what people found out about it there wasn't any tv or radio or anything else it was by newspapers printing the story as they wanted to print it sometimes they, they generated all it all on their things. own <laughs> They underwrote all kinds of things. Over Donner Summit, the first mm -hmm. transcontinental bike race was run at the behest of uh, San Francisco and New York newspapers, and they followed it breathlessly day after day. So the Donner Party fits right into all of that. And later on, uh, Hearst paid for, I think it was Nellie Bly, to race around the world mm -hmm. and to reproduce Jules Verne. Uh, story of around the world in 80 days or whatever it was and and uh, uh, they actually had an, an arrival of Pulitzer got another woman to do it and they were racing each other around the globe uh, filing stories you know by telegraph and stuff uh, uh, and and people were captivated by it 
Yeah, and even if you look at some of those early stories, I don't think you saw that much about who these people were that went and did the relief parties. It was only about the sensationalism at the lake. It wasn't like, well, what about these other seven or 15 guys that went up and, and hauled all these people out or anything about John Stark or, you know, carrying kids through the snow for three or four days. Uh, you well, wait, let's, that make up some, let's make up some <laughs> stuff about the lake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The rescue itself so wasn't cool. enough. Mm -hmm. Ah. The rescue to me, I mean, that is amazing that they did that. I just, I still am, am awed by all of the whole story to like the whole thing, but the, 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 the drive of the rescue people to me is amazing that they did that. I, I, they did it for strangers. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that is so well, that, cool. That timeline on John Stark. On the other side, you know. Yeah, the timeline on John Stark arriving at Starve Camp and turning around with those kids and then the people that went on to the lake and then all the way back over the past past him going back before he got back to Bear Valley. It gives you an idea how much work that guy did for what, three, four days in the snow carrying kids back and forth. It's just hard to fathom. I can't so, wrap my head around that. <laughs> yeah, well, One of the things that what we're all talking about is the the challenge of rewriting history where um, people in the 1800s for a variety of reasons glommed on to the cannibalism as, as the, the signature part of the story of the Donner Party epic. And uh, there have been hundreds of books or you know, dozens of books and hundreds of papers and thousands of of stories uh, that, that generate out of Donner Party. And, and uh, you have the narrative of the, the, the relief party, which has been mostly buried. Very few stories about that. And then coming to, to uh, today's world, uh, the whole uh, um, narrative around Sutter and what's been happening, taking his uh, statue down uh, in front of Sutter Hospital and uh, you know, uh, a lot of lobbies to de-sutter Sacramento because of uh, what he uh, reportedly did to the Native Americans. And of course, what generally manifest destiny did across the board to Native Americans and, and how that story really hasn't been highlighted, partly because it's oral history. And so people say, well, prove it. And they say, well, the way we prove it is we pass it down from generation to generation. We don't write it down. We pass it down orally. My question is, is, is with your families um, who are tied directly to these stories, <clears throat> have you seen any change? Has the, has the dial moved at all, either more negative or more positive? And negative would be cannibalism. That's clearly the thing that everybody wants. And positive would be heroism. Where are we on that dial if zero is cannibalism and 10 is heroism? And has it changed in your lifetime? Definitely in my family, yes. Yes, the heroism and the, again, the perseverance. But I so appreciate that you're, you're showing the heroism of those rescuers because I don't think that's been done properly at all. Uh, I know I don't know their stories well enough. Our family had a reunion at Johnson's camp several years ago, well, probably 25 years ago. I don't know if the people at the Johnson ranch still allow public there, but they were very gracious to us. There were quite a few survivors and families who gathered that day, but um, there's never been enough recognition of the heroism of the rescuers. So glad you're doing that. We can give him a Johnson Ranch update, huh, Bob? Uh, yeah, Johnson Ranch is owned by uh, a wealthy landowner today, which it was back then, um, before Johnson got a hold of it, and he wasn't terribly wealthy. But and uh, it's it's closed to the public. We've uh, thankfully uh, got a, a person that is involved with the Wheatland Historical Society that's get, gotten us permission to end our journey from Forlorn Hope there in December 
2020, and, and we will start our journey there uh, in a few weeks. Um, but generally it's closed. However, they're working very hard to turn that into a, a state park, a piece of it, to carve the, uh, the, the Camp Far West, which was uh, a military post and the graveyard that's there. And then historically significant where the Burris Hotel was and the Adobe House of Johnson and try to carve that out so that it's preserved as a state, if not federal park. And um, I think progress is being made. These kinds of conversations help because it brings it to the attention of the general public. And um, as you've seen, both of you participate in the Facebook uh, group. There's a lot of people that are very interested in this, not just for the history, but for getting the story right and for making sure we don't lose uh, touch with these important um, strings that we're all part of. Obviously, your direct descendants, you, as you said, you wouldn't be here if it weren't for that. But we all in California and around the world feel, uh, as Elka said and, and Jennifer said, we feel a tremendous sense of responsibility to keep this going forward. It's yeah. interesting to me, I didn't grow up in California. And it's so it's such a big part of California history and everybody that I know that is from California, you know, they all learned about it. And so it's interesting to me not being from California or living there, how many people I have to explain to them what the Donner Party is or they've never heard of it. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to me, but um, I, I don't know. And I've always known about it because obviously it's my family, but you guys are so entrenched in it. And the fact that, you know, like you live in Sebastopol, Donna, I, and that you guys can go to the places all the time. I mean, I've only been there a few times in my life just because I'm not, I don't live there. Um, so I'm a little jealous in that respect. Go ahead, Frank, you're showing up the steed book, right? I wanted to mention, uh, if you're interested in Johnson's Ranch, uh, Jack Steed's book, The Donner Party Rescue Site, has a bunch of stuff on the archeology, span uh, of Johnson's Ranch and, and the history of it and all that. Uh, I have that book too, Frank. Uh -huh. That's it, my, I, I downsized and got rid of most of them, but that's a keeper. <laughs> that's a keeper. You, you know, you I mentioned- know, Coming from out of state, my okay. husband was from Iowa, but when he came into our family and heard the story, he read every book he could get his hands on. And he said, what a tragedy that nobody in this family has ever named a daughter Tamsin because he thought Tamsin Donner was a real shero, the way she stayed with her husband when she could have been rescued. Uh -huh. Well, I was glad we had three sons because <laughs> I didn't think it would be fair to put that on a girl, but our fourth child was a daughter. And her name, Tamsin, now she's a dental hygienist and she wears her Tamsin name tag. And she said, it's a great conversation starter. Oh, that's oh awesome. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. great. You know, you had mentioned, Donna, that if, you know, the, the, the forlorn hope of one of the things that when Bob and I presented uh, the story at the Oregon California Trail Association in Elko, um, you know, one of the things Bob did is he went back and he, he measured how many more people would have perished at the lake and at Alder Creek had the forlorn hope not gotten out because you would have had another two weeks oh, yeah. of no food, another 15 mouths to feed and on and on. I think our, our calculation was somewhere around 25,000 people today. Wow. And can, you know, raise a glass to the forlorn hope and thank, Indeed. you know, say thanks for that. By the time you yeah. look at what would have happened had they not made it out. It's kind of a fascinating uh, None you know, of this would kind of be extra here. Extrapolation of the story. Yeah. None of this would be here. <laughs> or all our progeny. Uh, uh, as I think maybe all uh, people on the call know, the Discovery Channel is doing a uh, uh, an episode of, of one of their series uh, in conjunction with the, uh, the reenactment of the, of the rescue uh, party. Uh, Cindy and Donna, if, if they aim the camera at you for a national audience, what would you want people to know uh, about the Donner Party or what, what point would you make if 
And okay, there's a national audience. What can you tell us about the Donner Party? What, what, what do you think is the most important thing about them? I would focus on the perseverance of, of the human spirit and, and the survival and, and really persevering to, to just get through it. You just do what you got to do, right? Everybody in their different situation, just you just did what you had to do and you persevere through it and they made it. Well, some of them. And thinking about the next chapter here, the uh, heroism of the rescuers really you know, it's a story that just has not been told enough or promoted enough. So glad you're doing that. Um, and yes, to ask people, what would you do if your child were starving to death and there was frozen human flesh right outside? What would you do if you knew that would enable your child to live. Yeah, <clears throat> much like the forlorn hope mothers going out and leaving their children behind. It's like uh, with the Reeds having to split their family up when the mother left and had to send the two children back and just, and that one quote by the child, well, we'll do well, mother, if I don't see you again, something to that effect. It's just like, oh my goodness. Yeah. It just, it's just so heartbreaking. So yeah, so tragic. Mm -hmm. And then they all made it, which is, you know, good ending. So, so many of those mothers had to make really, really tough choices. Tamsin, of course, foremost, you know, knowing that she'd paid someone to take her children who at one point may have just left them in the snow, but did actually bring them to us to another dwelling, but left them um, in lieu of taking Ludi, you know, taking their loot with them, uh, left the children again, she had to go back pay someone else to take those children, all the while knowing that her not leaving her dying husband, what was keeping her from taking her children out by herself? That's a really tough choice, but many moms yeah. said that Mrs. Murphy, she basically gave her life to take care of all of the children in her care, including that little Amanda McCutcheon's baby, who, uh, you know, that's a terrible burden for another mother to take another child. Um, meaning terrible because you have to make decisions about how to keep that child alive. So the, the, the stories about what the, the mothers had to do to help each other and to keep other women's children alive um, and their own and to make do with so little to entertain or feed their children is just, it's impossible for me or for a mother of three to imagine. You can see my son coming and going in the kitchen here. I'm trying to feed my three kids without you seeing them in the kitchen. I mean, imagine if all you have was some old cow hide and some shoelaces. I would be very sorely tempted to go cut the heart out of whoever was outside that snow cave because that's an impossible task. But but they did it and it's a it's amazing. And I used to think to myself, no, Forlorn Hope, why didn't they just choose to lay down and die. Some people do. Some people just say, this is too much. I've reached my limit. I'm just going to die. And they didn't do that. And I just think that is, I don't know why I find that so incredible. It would have been easier just to die of hypothermia than to right. keep feeling the pain right. of life. And but Jennifer, do you think that's why so many more women survived than men? There are many theories on why that happened. But one of them is that the mothers knew they had to live to keep their children alive. So they were perhaps more motivated to keep going. Also, women store more fat than men. Oh, yeah. Also, the men were out trying to find food and chopping down trees when there were trees. <laughs> well, I don't burn calories the same, but I feel like it's yeah. an absolute desire to keep your kids alive. I mean... Right. You'd throw yourself in front of an oncoming train for your kids, hundred right. percent. Yeah, and there was a and the men were about the vision of labor. Like the women's job was to take care of the children, the men's job was to do a lot of hard labor, and that depleted their fat supplies. But the women's job was to take care of the kids, so they had to do it. Like they were just doing their job as well. I mean, the fathers cared, but they had a different division of labor to do. So the, yeah. the women were like, "Oh, I have to do my job. This is my job." This is what I've been, take, you know, raised to do. Take care of everybody. And then men, you, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say. <laughs> go ahead. 
Jennifer's perspective is really interesting. Uh, what the mothers were thinking and why, what their motivations were. And nobody's really addressed that. It's always been from the, even with the forlorn hope, most of the survivors were women, but all of the focus is on the men and the, and the family names. That's so the story, story of our country, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's Don't right. go there. We don't need to go there. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I, I do think it comes down to the division of labor was for the women to take care of. As soon as the day stopped for the labor on the wagon train, their job was to start cooking, cleaning, getting everything out. And so I think that same thing carried through in the camps. Well, and the physicality for the men. So first of all, right, they were doing the, the hard, hard physical labor, not that the women weren't, but just different. Mm -hmm. But the men, a lot of the men, not all of them, but a lot of the men were significantly older than their wives as well, right? Mm -hmm. So they were like in, um, like in Jacob Donner's case, he was, I think, Betsy was his second wife, right? So was significantly younger. Um, and so that was the case in, in, in a lot of it too, is the men were that much older, plus they had the physical, much more hard labor on top of that. And then of course, women just, you know, we have to take care of everybody anyway. That's just what we do. We're moms. <laughs> There's a great story the book, uh, from- the book uh, Mothers brought that out better than any other. There's a great story uh, when, um, uh, Reed, Mrs. Reed was coming out with Mrs. Keysburg in, in relief party. Uh, let's see, it'd be relief party Two. one. Two. I think they were coming out in one and, uh, they got to Bear Valley and ultimately got to Mule Springs and, uh, the, uh, the sailor Woodward who was supposed to be bringing the supplies up and bringing the base camp up and ultimately providing provisions to relieve the relief parties. But he stopped at Mill Springs and put his feet up and, and they arrived and, and Miss Keevesburg had just lost her daughter Ada days ago. And, and yet still found a little humor in that she and Mrs. Reed were conversing and they came upon this guy Woodworth and he was having his feet massaged as he was drinking whiskey and uh, relaxing. And uh, Ms. Mrs. Reed said to Mrs. Kiesberg, I think we need to take care of him instead of him taking care of us. And it's, it's, it's classic, both, both from a women's perspective of taking care of the men then and now, but also the rescuer, the rescuees became the rescuers and they were both women. And one of them had just lost their daughter and yet still could find a sense of humor. That was the same time uh, Mrs. Kiesberg was riding the horse and her saddle wasn't tied on well. And uh, she kept slipping off to the side. And she would, she would say to Mrs. Uh, Reed again, I think I'm going to kill myself falling off the horse before I actually get to Johnson's Ranch. Um, the ability to command that kind of civility, sense of humor, in, in spite of everything that they'd gone through is remarkable. It is. I don't know that story, Bob. Where did that come from? Or if it's, I did? Yeah, it's, it's, it's in a few books, but one of them it's in is Ordeal by Hunger from George Stewart. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, there, there reminds yeah. me of uh, the story of Stark carrying the kids back and how he regaled them all the way down. They said, you know, he'd tell them stories and sing songs and whatever he could do to take their mind off the fact that they're trooping through snow for days at a time. Yeah, what I would not give to be able to watch 15 minutes of that. Yeah, in real he made, he made light of the fact that they he could carry so many because they were so light. Mm -hmm. Well, Bill. Well, this was a productive uh, evening. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, stay tuned for more adventures of the uh, Forlorn Hope or Donner Rescue Expeditions. They've got a lot coming up here in, uh, in a couple of weeks. You can also read about them in uh, our heirloom, our monthly newsletter of Donner Summit History. The March or the February issue this year is the background of the rescue expeditions. And the March issue will be about what's going to happen, along with 
how they got their clothes and how they distressed them. It's an interesting story, particularly Elka's uh, <laughs> methods. Are those available <laughs> online? The newsletter? That, that's online? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, on our website, Donner Summit Historical Society. Org. Right. If you go to the heirloom page, you can choose the right issue. Oh, thank you. That's free newsletter online. Oh, it's amazing. Free, free, free. Can we download the pamphlet that you were showing for those of us that uh, can't? An earlier be version. An earlier version. You, an earlier version. You can. Uh, haven't uh, haven't done that with this one yet. We'll uh, we'll make sure if you both uh, send your address, your mailing address, mm -hmm. we'll make sure you get a copy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got. And it might even them. be signed by the author. <laughs> oh. nice. okay. Well, you Where have to say pretty out? please. And and as a bonus, Great. we might even get another author to co-sign it. <laughs> yeah. So well, I think I that probably brings say... us to the end of the. Well, I just wanted the to say for thank tonight. you. I just think this has been really cool. And just I just think what you guys are doing is amazing. It's awesome. So thank you for really showcasing a different light and, and keeping it out there and, and helping people learn and understand. And I just think it's really awesome. Well, having you- I agree, Jenny. In, thank you so much, you guys. Having yeah. you both on, on this call has, for me, definitely breed life and I'll be carrying you both with me. Bless you. I would be there if I could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. not literally we won't make you come we want all the kids and grandkids too <laughs> <laughs> and we can reenact star carrying nine children out of uh you got that you got that bob yeah uh, uh. <laughs> all right thank well, you guys yeah good yeah, night everyone really appreciate it thank you good, good night. night thank you so much bye-bye okay. bye